through 4. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets and at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, and through whom he also he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful world. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to them. You may be seated. If you can see the slide that's on the screen, it may look familiar to you. I'm not sure if you've ever heard this illustration before, but it's basically, if you want to give it a name, the blind men and the elephant. Oftentimes you'll see this in some sort of uh, intro to philosophy class or comparative world religions, or maybe your friend who doesn't believe in Jesus brings this illustration up to you. He says basically something like, religion is like a bunch of blind men or women who are all touching a part of an elephant. And because they are blind, because they cannot see, what they feel, they interpret it as something else. The person who has their ear on, their hand on the ear says, oh, this is like, a, it's a, I'm holding a giant fan. The person who is standing on the side of the elephant, all they can feel is its side, so it must be a wall. The person who is touching the trunk of the elephant says, well, this, this feels like a snake, or the tusk a spear, or the tail a rope. And so the point of this illustration that many people would bring up is to say, don't you see that, that all of these people who are making these religious claims, they're all essentially claiming the same thing, the same reality, but because of their cultural background or because of their family upbringing, it comes across as different to them. But if they could just take a step back, they would realize that they're all essentially talking about the same thing. All religions are essentially the same thing, the argument goes. And I remember when I first heard that, I was probably either in high school or college, and I thought to myself, oh man, I don't know how to respond to this. And maybe you're in this room right now, and you've heard this illustration for the very first time today, or you've heard it before, and you're thinking to yourself, boy, I don't know what to do with this. What do I do with this? This seems like a pretty foolproof argument. There's two problems with this illustration, two sort of weaknesses in the armor. The first weakness is that despite the fact that everybody else has been blinded by their own background into thinking what they're experiencing is unique, there is this one narrator who is somehow able to take a step back and take off their blindfold to see that it's all the same thing. And so again, we ask ourselves the question, well, how, how does this sort of person have omniscient understanding of how religions are different? Whereas everybody else has been blindfolded, this one person who is enlightened, how are they somehow able to see beyond the blindfold? How, how are they able to sort of, in their own wisdom, take off their blindfold, whereas nobody else seems to be able to? What, it, what, why are they so unique? And the second problem with this illustration is, we ask ourselves a question. What if the elephant says something about who they are? I mean, not literally, like a, a Disney movie where you have talking elephants, talking animals, something like that. We're not, we're not attributing you know, that, that elephants can speak, in this case, English or in Mandarin or Spanish or Portuguese or something like that. But what if the elephant can communicate about who it is? This illustration assumes a passive elephant that is not really interested in communicating 
with the people, rather simply content to let people figure it out on their own. Hopefully you see the connection between that illustration and our scripture reading this morning. This idea that God spoke. If we were to attribute God as the elephant, which seems very strange to say, the elephant speaks, and the elephant lets the people know who it is. And that's how the book of Hebrews, the book that we are starting out, the book that our 2020 theme for the year, which I'll spend some more time talking about next week, centers around the book of Hebrews. It's a book that is deep in its theological wealth. It is rich in its practical application about what do we do with our faith in Jesus. It's also mysterious because when you're doing Bible study, when you're reading the Bible, the first thing that you want to do when, when you take your preaching class, or when you take your Bible study class, the question they automatically ask is, or the first question is, who wrote this book? Well, for Hebrews, we don't know. Okay, so we don't know. Uh, second question, when was it written? We don't know. We have some ideas about when it was written, some, you know, some, some historical markers that say, okay, it probably was written before this, and we'll talk about that more in the future. So we don't know who wrote it. We don't know when it was written. Okay, 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 so if we don't know who, if we don't know when, well then to whom was it written? Who, who is the audience? Because we, we want to know who it was written to. Because if you, if you come across a letter to somebody that you don't know who it was written to, then the letter doesn't really make sense, and it's hard to see the application in your life. So who was it written to? Well, we, we don't really know who it was written to. Whether it was written to Christians who are ethnically Jewish and have a lot of familiarity with the Old Covenant, or if it was written to a mixture of people, or if it was written to just uh, Gentile Christians to help them see how the Old Testament, as Sonia uh, eloquently pointed out, how the Old Testament feeds into the gospel and helps you see your need for Jesus. It, it could be any of those people. Who wrote it? Don't know. When was it written? Not really sure. Who was it written to? Uh, I've got a couple ideas, but we're not really sure. But even within those mysteries, even within those uncertainties, there's this picture that is at the center of Hebrews, and that is the exalted Jesus. Jesus shines through the book of Hebrews in such a way that it is almost impossible for you to come away with Hebrews not knowing who Jesus is. But also, not just simply as an educational, well, now I know who Jesus is and I can get the test answer right, but rather it has immense practical applications. So much so that it's like when you see Jesus for who he is, you don't go back to life the way that you used to. You don't go back to what you thought was important, your top priorities, your top mission in life. Because if Jesus really is who Jesus is portrayed as in Hebrews, that makes all the difference. You set your eyes on Jesus and you walk towards him. You don't go back. You don't give up even in the face of persecution or the realities of daily life when, when other stuff seems better than following Jesus. Other stuff doesn't ask me to sacrifice the, my priorities. But because of who Jesus is, we don't give up. We don't go back. And then finally, we don't go it alone. Now, middle school T-series will know, well, wait a second. One of the lessons was from Steve, sometimes a person of faith has to go it alone. Now, we know that what the rest of that message was, in reality, that person is never alone because of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the church. And I would say the same thing. Sometimes there are difficult situations in life where you have to go against the crowd. You have to stand up and say, I'm not going to do that, even though everybody else is. I'm not going to cheat off of you. I'm not going to let you cheat on me in school. I'm not going to go back to that website. I'm not going to watch that movie. I'm not going to be engaged in this relationship. Even though everybody else doesn't understand why I do that, why I abstain from that. 
why I deny myself that immediate pleasure. And so even though everybody else may not understand, sometimes we go it alone. But in Hebrews, it tells us as we're following Jesus, we don't follow Jesus alone. Don't think for one second, the author of Hebrews would say, that you can follow, success, you can follow Jesus successfully on your own without the benefit of other Christians. To think so would basically be removing yourself from God's power source, the Holy Spirit and the life of the church. So even within those mysteries of Hebrews, we know, don't go back, don't give up, don't go it alone because of who Jesus is. As we have read in that passage, there is this idea that God speaks God has spoken. It says, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. When you read the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, when you come across the book of Genesis, what is one of the first things that God does? He speaks. Let there be. And there is. And so it doesn't matter what it is. God says, let it be, and it is so. There is light. There's dark, there's earth, there's creation in all of its beauty. Because God spoke. The book of Psalm, in in one of the Psalms, in Psalm 19, it says that the heavens are declaring the glory of God. So as God speaks, creation happens. Creation then also sort of comes back or repeats and speaks of God's glory in its power, its majesty. The heavens are declaring the glory of God, it says. That's what some theologians call natural revelation. When you go out into the world and you say, because of the way that creation has been so finely tuned, existing in in, in this, this miraculous state, God surely must have created. There must be a creator for this to exist. That is called natural revelation. God reveals himself, his power, his glory through creation. And so that's natural revelation. But there's also another kind of revelation that God does called special revelation, where God isn't simply content to sort of create things and let it show his glory. God wants you to know him more than just the creator who created all things. There is this idea that was very popular in the founding of America. Actually, if you, if you know mu- much about American history, m- many of the founding fathers were what is called deists. There is this idea that deism is, is, is teaching that God is this, this impersonal God who created the world and sort of set it on its motion and is otherwise unconcerned with humanity. But that is not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is not content to have creation sort of exist apart from his interactions. And so God communicates in special revelation with his people. In the Hebrew scriptures, we see him doing this through the prophets and through the law. It was was God's way of saying, speaking, saying, this is who I am. I am demonstrating to you who I am, my character, as well as my expectations for you. If you want to have a relationship with me, this is what it's going to look like based off of who I am. God speaks. And that's what we've been studying for like the past year and a half. When we've been studying that Heaven and Earth series, the book of Habakkuk, the book of Nehemiah, we see how God is communicating with his people through his messengers, his prophets, as well as the kings. So just stop and think about that for a second. You know, we're we're bombarded with constant communication today. I get notifications on my phone about a hundred different things throughout the day. And so this idea about God communicating with us may sort of seem lost in a sense, but just think about how amazing it is that the God of the universe communicates to us, to you, who he is, and how he wants you to live. 
think about that compared to all of the other religions in the world where the, the objective is if you achieve enough, then you will be in God's good grace. But rather, the God of the Bible is the God who takes the initiative in communicating with people. He is the one who takes the first step. God is there, and he is not silent. So it says, in the past, he has done all of these things. God spoke. But now, in the last days, it says, he has spoken to us through his son. So he did all of these things in the past, but now. But now. As of now, the the title for this sermon series is, But Then Jesus. So God did all of these things in the past. This is how he spoke in the past, through prophets and through kings and through the law. law. But then Jesus shows up. And he speaks. He says, now in these last days, God has spoken through his son. Now when we hear this phrase, last days, some of it may sound kind of confusing. what, What does that mean? Simply, The last days is referring to every moment of time since the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus. Everything that happens after Jesus, his death and his resurrection and his ascension in heaven, everything that happens from there until the moment that he comes back is the last days. It's this new era in which God operates. It's not really tied into recent events. It's not really necessarily even tied into, you know, what one world government some people may be afraid of. It has, it's not really tied in with that. It's tied in with the death and resurrection of Jesus, his ascension into heaven, and his eventual return. And so it doesn't matter what generation you're a part of after Jesus. You could, whether you're an okay boomer, a Gen X, a millennial, Gen Z, I, Gen, who thinks that everybody who before you got it wrong, this is why you can say, okay, boomer, discounting every ounce of wisdom that your elders may have for you. Or, you know, the, the meme from a couple of years ago, this ain't it, chief. You know, everybody, everybody thinks that they can just immediately discount wisdom from the past. It doesn't matter what generation you are in or will be between the death, resurrection, and Jesus and his return. You are living in the last days. So in the last days, but now, but then Jesus. So in the last days, God spoke to us through his son. Now, what we need to understand is that when God spoke to us through his son, he's not coming up with something new. I think what happens sometimes is that we read the Old Testament separate from the New Testament. We think of the Hebrew scriptures as God's plan A, and when, well, that didn't work out, you know, the people weren't able to obey the law, then he sent Jesus. The initial plan was for God's people to earn their salvation through obeying the law, and that didn't work out, so God had to come up with plan B. And I I honestly think that that is the default way we read the Bible, because that is the default setting of how we think we should relate to God, by obeying him. And when I obey him enough... Then he will be happy with me. He will be pleased with me. I get to go to heaven or I will have a good life when I obey enough. Hopefully, over the past year and a half, two years of studying the storyline of the Bible, we realize that that is not God's plan. God's plan was not, well, I tried it this way and it didn't work, so now I have to come up with something new. But rather, we have seen how all of the Hebrew scriptures have been leading us up and to the point of Jesus. So when it says, but then Jesus, he's not coming up with plan B, but rather what he's saying is that Jesus is the fulfillment. He is the culmination of what God has been trying to do. He is the culmination, the fulfillment about God's plan for saving humanity. There is a couple passages up there that we can see from the New Testament about how Jesus even told his disciples, look, all of the Hebrew scriptures, all of the Old Testament is about me. Similarly, in the book of 1 Peter, he talks about there are these Old Testament prophets 
who were writing under the inspiration of God. God was telling them what to say or what to write, and they did it in their own personality, their own style, in their own unique setting. But ultimately, it was the spirit of Christ that was directing them what to say. Do you see how when the New Testament comes along, their objective is to say, don't you see that everything that was written before is actually leading up to what we, could, what we are saying? So that what you are now hearing from me is in agreement what was already written. I'm not coming to you with this new thing. I'm not coming to you with this new idea, this new way of living that where you just throw away everything from the past. But rather, I am coming to you with the fulfillment of what God has done. I am coming to you with the reality of God's promise. There's a way that some people say that living in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament time, was like walking around in a room that had a bunch of furniture in it, but the lights were off. You could sort of make stuff out. You could see where things were, and you'd bump into it occasionally. But by and large, it was sort of walking by faith, trusting that where you were going would be free. Where you were going was the right way. But when Jesus came around, it's like he turns the lights on. And so when you're able to look back at the Old Covenant, at the Old Testament, that room that people were walking in in with its furniture, you can say, ah, now I see where everything was. Now I see how it all fit together because Jesus came and he turned the lights on so, and he could let me see what it was all about. He goes on to say in Luke 24, it was all about me. Jesus is God's final revelation. And I know that this screen over here is, is fading, and so this information is all also over on the other side. So the book of Hebrews then goes on to say, give seven qualifications. You, you guys know when you go for, I mean, most of us here are, are students, and so you may not know this, aside from what people tell you. But when you go for a job interview, on your resume, you have to come up with a one-page description about why you are the most qualified person to do this job. And it's crazy hard. I think about how do I put down all of my education, all of my value, all of my worth onto one sheet of paper? It's hard. It really is because you know that there's so much more about you. You know that your value isn't just simply listed down as a bunch of credentials, but you also have to summarize who you are. And so that's what the writer of Hebrews does here is that he summarizes Jesus' credentials. He gives us Jesus, his resume, so that we could see who Jesus is, about why he is God's final word, why he is the culmination of God's redemptive plan, so that we don't go looking somewhere else, that we, that we don't say. And I think that our default heart, or the way that our hearts naturally go is, yeah, 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 we have Jesus, but I really feel like I need to add to him. I really feel like I need to add my good works to what Jesus has done in order for me to sort of stay in God's grace. I think that we can all sort of identify with that feeling. It's like, I know Jesus died for me, but I'm still not living well enough for him. I'm not obeying him enough, and so I, I have to add to what Jesus has done. But rather, the author of, the, of Hebrews gives seven qualifications for why what Jesus has done is, is enough. It is the fulfillment of what God has done. And he borrows Old Testament language to prove his point. It says that he is the heir of all things. Just like when God created the garden with man and woman in Genesis chapter 1. And he says to them, I give you everything. It says that Jesus is the heir of all things. It says that through whom all things were created. In the same way that God spoke all creation into existence, here in Hebrews we say, we see it was done through Jesus. He is the radiance of God's glory. We think about that time in Exodus where Moses met with God and he came down on the mountain and the people couldn't handle seeing Moses because God's glory reflected in a small way. 
in Moses and his face. And they were like, Moses, like put a veil over your face. Put, like, put a curtain in front of you because God's glory is reflecting off of you in this small way and we can't handle it. And we know that through the story of Moses is that glory faded away after a while. But in Jesus, we see the fullness of God's glory as well as the exact representation of his being in the person of Jesus. And he's the one who sustains all creation by the power of his word. He is the one who has provided purification. We think about how the priests in Leviticus and Exodus and and Numbers had to do that. We see that the priests had to do that time and time again. Their job was never done. But here we see that Jesus is the one who provided purification for his people once and for all. And he sat down at the right hand of the Father. When you read the Psalms, you see how God's king is seated at the right hand of God. And here we see Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. Now I know that as we come up to this idea of God's Son, this idea of sonship in the Bible is complex. And I'll have to spend some more time in later weeks talking about this. But in the Bible, this, the idea of sonship is tied up not only with your identity, but your function. Identity we get because we think biological sonship. But also, in the Bible, when it talks about sonship, it's talking about reflecting who your father is. Doing what your father has done. Imaging him in such a way that it brings honor to your, fa- your parents. So Jesus is God's son, both in identity, but also in what he does. The way that he reflects God's glory to the people. And I think that many of us in here, we, we, we understand that idea about how we image our parents. If we want to use gender-specific language, how sons mirror their fathers, but we know that it's not limited to just men. Because how often do you think to yourself, I want to be a good reflection of who my parents are? We don't act in a certain way because we don't want to dishonor our parents. We don't want to bring shame to our family. We want to be good sons. We want to be good daughters. We want to show that our parents are worthy of trust and honor. The greatest threat that I could give to somebody at WTC is, I will call your parents, and they will come and pick you up. And then you will enjoy a nice ride home with them. And that like, stops it right there, because we don't, want our, we don't want to reflect poorly upon our parents. We want to image them well. And the same way Jesus does that, he images what the Father has done. But not simply as a function, not simply as the way we think about it, but also as an identity. And this is where Christianity separates itself from other religions. It really does right here. This idea that Jesus, even though he was on earth and fully human, He also was the exact representation of God's being. This idea of exact representation, like we know, we think about coins, how it has like the image of President Lincoln or President Washington on them. Like we see that and we're like, oh yeah, that that is that president. And we know that with that stamp, as well as the monument that's on the back, as well as the, the slogan that says, out of many, one, we know that when we see that coin, that image, that that reflects what America is about, and the values that it tries to instill. But we also know that that coin is not actually George Washington. We know that there are differences between the material and the reality. And so the image starts to break down there. But in the reality is, is that when you see Jesus, the image of God, you actually see God that you don't need to wonder what God is like, that you don't need to wonder his character, because in Jesus you see the fullness of God, the fullness of the radiance of God in the exact representation of his being. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, it says, we see the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Jesus. Now I know that as... I'm saying this, you're probably thinking to yourself, well, wait a second, how can Jesus be the exact representation of God the Father, who is spirit? The Bible says he's spirit. How can Jesus be both 
fully God and fully man. How can he have the exact, exact representation of God's glory and his exact representation of his being while at the same time not being God the Father? And if you are new to Christianity, welcome to the club. We're not trying to understand that. It's one of the crazy things, if I could put air quotes around it, that Christians celebrate and that we ask you to believe. This belief that there is one God who exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. And that all of these persons have always existed. There was never a time when there was not God the Father. There never was not a time that there was not God the Son or God the Spirit. And there never was a time when all three of those persons did not exist at the same time. And so, for example, it is wrong to say that God exists in one and he manifested himself as God the Father in the Old Testament and then as God the Son in the New Testament and then God the Spirit in the life of the church. It is wrong to say that because God exists in three persons from all eternity. And it's hard to understand that. But we are not embarrassed by it as Christians. I think sometimes what happens is that nowadays it's kind of popular to apologize for things that Christians believe. Like, oh yeah, well, we do, we do believe that, and, you know, whatever. But this is actually something for us to embrace and to celebrate, to find beautiful, because this is who God is. And this is the relationship that he invites us into. It's mysterious. It's impossible to fully understand, but it is beautiful, because it is who God is. <coughs> as we close this sermon, finish up the last couple points, I just want to draw some parallels for you guys. Because I think when we read this about who Jesus is, we're like, oh, that's cool. That's amazing even, even if our minds are blown. But if it just stops with us saying, look how great Jesus is, we're almost missing the application point. Because the very things that Jesus demonstrates in his relationship to who he is next to God, he offers to us in a relationship. As Jesus is the heir of all things, so he promises people who trust in him, we too will inherit the entire earth. The book of Romans in chapter 8 says that we are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Isn't that amazing? That the thing that Jesus possesses, he gives to us? It is our inheritance in Christ. We shall be co-heirs with Christ when he returns. We shall rule with him. Similarly, as Jesus reflects the glory of God, so too does he promise that through the power of the Spirit, we are being transformed. God's glory resides in us so that we are being transformed from one degree of glory to another through God's spirit. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, it says, and we all who with unveiled faces, referring to Moses, contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory. And so if Jesus promises you all of these things, to be an heir with him, to inherit the entire world, and that his spirit is working in you, even right now, transforming you from one degree of glory to the next. Why would you go back? Why would you so fearfully wonder if following Jesus is really worth it, if he has promised you such things? Why would you so desperately hold on to fear, feeling like you've got to hold a little bit back from following God because you're never really quite sure if following God is worth it, it means that you may not get into that good college because maybe for your own sanity, you realize I have to stop studying because it is dishonoring to God for me to push myself this hard. Or I have to take time off of work because I am not serving and loving my family enough. If God has promised, promised you such an inheritance, why would you go back? Why would you give in? Why would we become so enamored by every single bit of technology and streaming video where we lip sync a song for 30 seconds and we come up with a dance? Why would we become so enamored by those things that God becomes boring to us? 
Why would we? Because of our sin. And I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up. And they're going to lead us in some singing as we take communion. Jesus earned the right to these things. Even though in all eternity he existed in that glory. Because of what he has done for us in the cross. The cross of Jesus was his exaltation. The cross of Jesus was the way that he provided purification for us. That last phrase that I read, Jesus sat down at the right hand of God. If you were to go into the Old Testament times and you were going to the tabernacle in the Holy of Holies, where once a year the high priest went in there with the blood to sprinkle on the Ark of the Covenant, you would, you would see the Ark of the Covenant and a few other things, but you would not see a chair in there. There was no place for the high priest to come in and rest, to relax, to catch his breath, because there was this idea that in the presence of God, when sin was atoned for, you went in, you did the business that you were called to do, and you got out. There was no relaxation in there. It was not a casual affair, because it had to happen time and time again. There was no rest for the priests because the blood of bulls and goats could never take away our sin. But we see in Jesus, who provided purification for our sin, the once and for all sacrifice to bring us into a relationship with our God. And because of Jesus' once and for all sacrifice, that there is no more need for, for, there is no more need for sacrifice the blood of animals, Jesus was able to sit down at the right hand of the Father as the way of saying, it is finished. And so my simple conclusion for you at the end of this message is for you to ask, who is Jesus for me? Do I see him as the scripture portrays him? Are there areas of my life where I feel like this is distracting me to where I become more enamored by the praise of this world or the fear of this world rather than seeing Jesus the exact representation of God's glory who promises me that as well in faith. Let's pray.